This episode brought to you by Peter Wood's Museum of the Impossible. What's a Museum of the Impossible? It's going to be like Harry Potter meets Ripley's Believe It or Not. It'll be a -a one-of-a-kind, themed, interactive space where people can experience the impossible. But I need your help. To get the project started, I've set up a Patreon over at museumoftheimpossible.com. If you're able to throw a few bucks my way each month, we can build it together. Thanks for your support, and I can't wait to welcome you into the Museum of the Impossible. Welcome to the podcast of The Impossible. I'm Peter Wood, and if you want to see a very rare photo of me in a top hat, well, there's one posted on the homepage of my guest's website today. Please welcome Kate Sullivan Nelson. There we go. <laughs> um, I, 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 I played with the music when we weren't recording, but it's just something about recording that, you know. Um, yeah, so there is a, no one will see a photo of me in a top hat on any of my promo material. And yet there is an Easter egg. If you go to scgentertainment.com uh, and you look around a little bit, you will find uh, a photo of me wearing a top hat. Um, because the joke is that at least half the time that Kate and I work together, there's some sort of a costume request. It rarely is a requirement, but it's like, we've got a circus theme. We have a, um, like a steampunk turn of the century theme. Um, and I'm just trying to remember before we, I should have looked back through my notes or something. Wasn't there some event? It didn't end up happening where it was like a presidential, themed event where the the question was like could i dress up like like a patriotic figure and then there was also something about the actual um the the what i was supposed to be talking about or the the theme of it does that ring any bells or am i completely making this up no that sounds like something that i would do okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah it didn't work so out for i don't i don't know exactly why cuz i you know i always try on the one hand i want to bring people my a material when when i am doing a show but i also enjoy the challenge of um, you know, I, I mean, I love theming, uh, just personally. So I love like, how is there a way that I can take my existing product as I've rehearsed and presented and tweak it so that it totally fits with the theme. So that's one of the reasons I love, love working with you guys. Um, but, uh, so I have two, uh, questions. I have a boring question and then I have a really, um, fun question. I think, um, I boring one. my boy, I'm going to start with the boring one. <laughs> I think I know what a destination management company is. Like I have a vague idea of what a DMC is, but um, only as like a, a performer connecting with them. So how, as, as someone who, who you know ran one, what is your definition of, of a DMC? So they are the experts in their local destination for... Uh, meetings and events that are coming into into town. Right. So the benefit to meeting planners are um, the meeting planners might be from Kentucky. They might be from California right. and they're coming to DC. They don't know anything. They don't know the venues. They don't know the decorators. They don't know the caterers. They don't know the right. entertainment companies. They don't, they, they're coming in blind. They, they might know a little bit from the convention and visitors bureau, but they're not allowed to, they're not supposed to, you know, they can make some connections, but it's, Uh, they're, they're not going to be able to give like the best recommendations for who to use for that particular meeting. So the DMCs um, can handle everything for them. The, the site selection, the catering, you know, they're, they're sort of like your one-stop shop, even uh-huh. handling your transportation to and from the airport tours. Uh, I used to do tours of DC, mm, okay. um, which I actually, I enjoyed that um, part of it. Cause it was it's performance. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and then, you know, your your events and your entertainment, it's all part of it. So, and they can even book hotels. So they they just do everything. So what do you need when you're here? We'll we'll manage it for you. Right. Okay. But that's really what they do. That makes yeah, that makes sense. So a lot so, of work. Yeah, well, sure. But but also, I mean, yeah, you don't you don't just want to rely on Google or TripAdvisor for uh, all that. And and especially then if 
even if they are a, a, a meeting planner who's capable of juggling all those elements, it's going to be hard to do that long distance from in, in another city. So that makes a lot of sense. Right. And um, then, you know, the meeting planners, um, because I know that side of things too. I mean, they have so much on their plates yeah. uh, already with just managing the content of their, their meeting and their breakout sessions and their AV and, you know, right. all the things that happen and the content. Um, for that, it's so much work just for that, that it's really a benefit to have someone to outsource all the other stuff to. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Especially if they can just come to you and say, or, 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 you know, I know you're not doing a specifically DMC stuff now, but you know, coming to a company and just say, all right, and then there's going to be a gala go like we, we, we need, we need, we, we've got so much else that we're dealing with it, with the meeting itself, but then we want to have some party at the end. So we need someone to make that happen. All of those moving right. parts, you know? Um, right. And cool. be, because I was in that world for so long, a lot of, they are, a lot of my clients are DMCs right, right. Um, here in the DC area. And even, even in other destinations that I know very well, um, mm. I'll, still work with some of them around the country um because i understand i, I always tell them i understand your plight <laughs> right it's such right. a hard job yeah, and so yeah. i try desperately to like make their jobs a little easier because i know how much uh how demanding it is sure. um so yeah it's a, it's a tough one yeah. Well, yeah, I would imagine it's the sort of thing where then they will they would prefer for prefer to work with you again uh, just the 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 easier and low maintenance and low drama you are like the if if you're making their job easier by having all of your uh, part of it run smoothly then you're not uh, a, you know a monkey wrench in, in the whole machine so um, right. yeah that makes sense um, actually so speaking of all over the country uh, the fun question I want to talk about is how awesome New Orleans is um, because it's one of uh, my wife's and my favorite cities. And I'm super jealous that you got to go to college there. And then I know you end up back there uh, both for work and for fun. Um, what was that scene like? Like, what's it like, uh, you know, being a, a college student in New Orleans? That sounds wild. Uh, where do I begin? Well, I'll, I'll start with I was just there a couple of weeks ago okay. taking my 17 year old niece to see Tulane. And nice. it was like kind of wild. Being back as the, you know, oh, let's let me show you <laughs> where sure. you could go. Um, it was it was a great experience. I mean, uh, I fell in love with the city first and the school was sort of secondary, okay. uh, if I'm okay. being totally honest. And, and I loved the school as well. Um, but I the city was my first love. Um love everything about it. And I, I yeah. love all the good things about it. And the, there's a lot of grittiness about it. Um, you know, the, the music and the food and the culture and the people, it's really the, the people are just delightful. I like yeah. to hear their stories. Um, going to school there was, was a trip. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I really got immersed in the city. I didn't just stay on campus. You know, I, bartended. I worked at a day camp. I worked at a magazine. I worked at an ad agency. I uh, was a swim instructor. I did, I did. I had so many jobs. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I was just always out and about doing different things. Um, and I loved that. I kept myself really busy that way. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was fun. <laughs> it was a fun time. Yeah. Um, my, my, you know, greatest, friends are, are from there from that time in my life. I married one, uh, right. <laughs> kept him with me permanently. Good. Um, you know, just the city itself is, is like being in the theater, just observing yeah. the antics around you. And I think having that time there really formed me into who I am now and, and, what I'm doing now. Um, it informed so much of who I am and my life and my career choices. Um, sure. that it's just, it was, I would never trade that experience for anything else. Yeah. Yeah. It, no, it is hard. I, I feel like the word vibe is overused and often not quite, it's just sort of a placeholder word for like, I can't really, I don't have other good words for it, but like, 
something about uh, Las Vegas and New Orleans are are the two where we're like, it's just we just kind of want to be here. Like we're fine with just like in you know you eat and then you people watch and then you eat and that's a fine day. You know, like you don't have to. It's not like Disney World, which I love as well, but for totally different reasons. You know. Um, and there's just something about just hanging out in, uh, in new Orleans and exploring and, and you're totally right. Like just all, I, you know, the people that you encounter there are lovely. Even, even if you're just a total tourist, like they're, they're not treating you as such, you know? Um, so yeah, there is something about, about that city. And, um, and I'm curious also, like in terms of obviously Mardi Gras being so huge, like how much, um, how much has that sort of informed um, your 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 business now? Like, are you are you finding that there are times where you can sort of pull from your uh, you know Nolan's experience in in when you're putting an event together now? Like, how much how much does that tie in for you? Oh yeah, I'm one hundred percent. I think um, the so Mardi Gras itself, um, it's, it's like on weeks and weeks <laughs> of, yeah. of immersive theatrical explosion, you know, like it's an extravaganza, right, right. um, but you're, you're a part of it, right? You're not, you're not just a parade watcher. You're, you're a part of that, that moment, that experience. Um, and it, it becomes a way of life. Um, one of the things that we try to do with our experiences in our company is, is, is almost recreate that feeling mm. um, when we're doing an event because it brings me such a joy to, to, to just have that, that feeling. And it's, it's a feeling you kind of feel it. You feel it. You can't see me. You feel it like in the pit of your stomach and then right. you feel it like right here in your heart. Um, when you know that it's working, mm -hmm. um, and that, that people are feeling that, that energy. Right. Um, and that's, an, that is something that Mardi Gras does and they've, they, they've nailed it. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a lot of spectacle and, and, and other things, you know, around that, but, um, it's a celebratory experience. And I, I think it's important to bring those moments into everyday life. Um, and, and so that's one of the ways I can do that is through these, these events and having these little interactive moments. Right. Right. Where you can sort of put the rest of your life to the side, even if it's for like that 30 second interaction. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that I'm always, that's always informed sort of my choices and how I present things. Right. Right. No, there's I, there is sort of a, a an over the topness to to your the the events that I've not only been a part of but then also again uh, uh, your Instagram and your website. Um, it, you know anyone who's bringing you in wants that extra visual impact or that extra sort of uh, some cool connection. Like even I mean I just think about um, you could easily have a uh, just a display of champagne flutes and people go over and they grab uh, a glass. But, you know, when you have somebody in a costume that is made up of champagne flutes and they're handing them out to people like that's, that's just that extra push. But then like, that's the kind of thing that people will be talking about. You know, no one's going to be talking about the actual quality of the champagne probably, but what they're going to be talking about is the fact that there was a cool, a cool costume and a person in it and they were, and they were the ones handing it out, you know? Um, and I'm curious sort of when, um, you, you know, your website talks about the holistic approach, which I think is really, really a great way of thinking about sort of the best event. You, you want to start with big picture. Even when I'm just talking with someone about doing a, a magic show, I always want to start with like, okay, well tell me, tell me what else is going on. You know, what's the whole, what's, and then let's see how I can sort of, um, you know, work well with what's already there. Um, so when a client comes to you, I'm just sort of curious, like, I'm sure you do a lot of listening. And then how do you get to that point where you're like, all right, we're going to put a person in a costume with champagne flutes, you know, like how, how do you sell them or, or are you listening to them first? Like sort of what, what's the, what's that rough 
t- timeline or path like when somebody reaches out to you? Well, it's, well, of course it's different for every client. And sometimes I'm working, sometimes I'm working with a lot of information and they give me a lot of time for the conversation. And sometimes I, I, I have to do a lot of guesswork, um, mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> uh, which I've gotten really good at. Um, <laughs> but when I'm able to, you know, have that conversation, which is very important clients of the world, uh, sure. to, to make that time for just a phone call. Um, I try to find out just broad question. Who's the group? Why are they there? What are you doing there? What's the purpose of the event? Um, I can sometimes just work off of that information, right? Because I'm like, okay, uh, I understand who you are, what you're doing. Um, Theming, if there's anything in place or not, or do you need help with that? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I help clients create the theme or even taglines for their events and things like that. Um, I try to then make suggestions that I think will resonate with their particular audience. Um, I have a good example. Um, Last year, I worked with, you know, Nuclear Energy Institute. So, and I'm working with them again this year. And it's like, who are they? Okay, we've got nuclear physicists, engineers, you know, these very like high level thinkers right sure. they're going to want something very like techie out there kind of very interesting that relates to what they do and think the way they do so i work with this artist who does digital art live digital art mm. he's actually a former physicist who went to oxford <laughs> i'm trying oh, to cool. remember everything and i thought <laughs> connection Perfect. So he yeah. did their event. They loved it. They were able to interact. So I try to find something that, I mean, that's a very, very direct connection right there. It's always not always yeah. that direct, but I do always try to find a way to make the entertainment something that the audience is going to connect with on a level that's going to um, resonate with them and and stay with them you know, for years down the road, because why else do we do these events to make an impact? So, so that's my method. I mean, and of course, other things come into play, like logistics and the boring stuff, as we say, you know, like, all right, are we just getting people from point A to point B or, you know, things like that. Um, And I try to come up with fun ways of moving them from point A to point B. So they don't realize that we're really just hurting them. (laughs) Right, right, right we're hurting them in a fun way um so and then personality types you know i i try to match um i try to match entertainers uh, you know with the the personality types of the different groups i mean you've experienced so many uh, different groups and you know you're so adaptable but i think you you see you know how important that is um to make that match really uh appropriate for the the group otherwise they're not going to understand what the heck is going on (laughs) yeah well and i mean a lot of it is sort of like adjusting to the energy level of them because uh you know i i know performers who um would either come in at a hundred miles an hour guns a blazing to a bunch of people who've just been a meeting all day. And they're like, okay, whoa, 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 just ca- ca- calm down a little bit, you know? Um, or, or, or similarly then if it's a really fun, active in, you know, we're having a good time and we're, you know, dancing. And then like, if I'm going to try to get you to look at a long card trick on a table that, that kills the vibe as well, you know? So it's, it's trying to, yeah, feed off of sort of, all right, how, how fast paced are we? How, what, you know, are we thinking or we just want to see some cool visual stuff and kind of go with that, you know? Um, and I, I'm also curious, uh, at, do you, when you're thinking about entertainment, do you sort of differentiate between, um, like wallpaper, passive entertainment and active, like, you know, for using music as an example, you might have a jazz combo that is specifically designed for background music, like high end, but not really interactive as opposed to a DJ or a band that with like a singer that's doing, you know, hits that people are supposed to dance to Um, sort of, how do you, how do you differentiate or what, what makes you decide to use one or another at a particular event that you're putting together? 
Yeah, that um, it depends on on the format of the event. Um, some clients really want the music to be just. I can kind of tell that it's happening, but I don't want to. No, I don't want it to interfere with conversations. I want them right, to right. just. We do, we want it to be purely background. Um, and so we we adjust for that. Right. Um, some of them want it to be setting the tone or the theme. Um which would be a little more forward, uh, a little more of a centerpiece. Mm. Um, it really depends on on what the what they need for that that okay. format of that event. If they and then it, like is there dancing? Do they want to get the energy up? Um, then I might you know go in a different direction for that. Um, it's it's really just like on a per event basis, like if they sure. want more conversation happening and, and it can still happen uh, with certain things. It's like, what do they want that energy level to be is probably a better question. Right. Well, that's so, one of the things that made me think about it, it, a better example. Um, I often at events that I work with, with you, there will be like an aerial act and or a contortionist. And it was interesting to me. I never really realized that they also can be either active or passive. It's either just something that's going on in the background that's cool to look at every now and then, or it could be like, okay, now I'm going to put on a show, you know? Um, so it's, yeah. it's just fun that, that, that they're able to sort of, get, because that's hard. I mean, I'll, it is hard for me to be wallpaper entertainment because sometimes that's what the client wants. Um, and, and so then it's not, and I'm not saying that as an ego thing. It's just like, by design, it's interactive. Like I don't have a lot of routines where I'm just standing there making flowers and rabbits and doves appear and you're just watching it or you're not, you know? Um, so I'm sort of envious of the performers who are able to have both an active or a passive, like I'm just here, I'm doing my thing. And if no one pays any attention to me, I'm still doing my thing, you know? Um, yeah, that, that is an art form in itself, but of just being able to navigate the difference. And then also, I've had many conversations with performers about navigating it when it suddenly changes and you don't expect it to. Sure. Yeah. Because that happens, you might you might have been hired to be wallpaper, but the group all stops and watches you. Right. Right. Exactly. Oh, what do I do now? Yep. Yep. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this. Yeah. Um. And so that's actually a conversation I have with any of that type of act an entertainer now um oh. because i've seen it happen so many times of right. we have to be able to navigate that because we can't necessarily control that you just have to feel the energy in the room and watch them and read the room and yeah. adjust yeah 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 um, and if you're able to adjust i mean that is a skill so a very important one what and adjust in both directions again like if they're coming in expecting an engaged audience and they're going to do a show and that's not what the, the audience is feeling, then you still have to provide the thing that you've promised to your client without, without totally um, uh, monopolizing the conversations and whatnot, you know? So yeah. yeah finding yeah, that, that. Yes. I've definitely seen the, the converse happen. Sure. Um, sure. As well, which is harder uh, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Harder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but manageable. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, and, and what's great, you know, as long as, as long as the event staff, if everyone can check their ego at the door, which is, I, I realize sometimes a, a challenging thing, but like I'm there, uh, like literally someone is passing hors d'oeuvres and I'm doing magic and we are on the same page. And if somebody doesn't want to engage with me, it's no different from them not wanting the crab puff, you know, uh, like it's all good. Um, right. and, uh, and it had, but I, I think there has to, as long as everyone's on that same page, then, um, I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of drama, certainly working with Skylark events. There's, there's never been any like, oh that person needs to tone it down or anything. So, you've, right. uh, you, you definitely have, have curated a, a good, good group of folks, uh, certainly with, based on my experiences, it's been a lot of fun. It's um, a, it's a good team. The yeah. DMV especially has just such a really great community. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, and I enjoy everyone so much. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I love, I love being a part of it. 
Um, and uh, we should let people know uh, that if they want to find out some social stuff with you, uh, the Instagram account, which I highly recommend taking a peek at, uh, is Skylark Creative GRP. Uh, they can also look for Skylark Creative, uh, um, uh, Skylark Creative Group Entertainment um, on Facebook. They can search for you. I'm sure Skylark Creative and it'll pop up. Uh, but then also your uh, website is SCG, like Skylark Creative Group, scgentertainment.com. Uh, so folks can find out more about all the awesome stuff uh, that you have going. And then certainly if they're putting together, uh, you know, a, a bigger event where you do need to have, we want a carnival theme, we want a circus theme, we want, or even a theme that we don't know yet, but we know we want there to be some, some extra, you know, um, uh, element to it, uh, then definitely they, you're a good person to reach out to. So um, thank you so much for hanging out with me here today. This was a ton of fun. Thanks, Peter. Um, this was a blast. I enjoyed it. And uh, and thank you to our, our listener for sticking with us. Uh, but that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, for behind the scenes access to my Museum of the Impossible Project, as well as info about my public shows, uh, private events, social media, and more, you can head on over to peterwood.com. I'm Peter Wood. Thanks. Thanks.